Hi, I'm Pastor David List at Impact Church in Wilson, North Carolina, and I'm glad that you're with us. We're going to be studying the book of Deuteronomy in just a few moments here. This week we're in chapter 13. Uh, it's a challenging passage for us in the era that we live as we see how God commands his own people to have zeal and to live a pure life before him. And also in light of the cross and what Jesus did for us, how to take our zeal for the Lord and live it with grace and compassion also. So I pray that you'll be blessed by this study and thank you for, for being with us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to learn from it. I pray as we study this that you will help uh, take your word, apply it to our lives, uh, inspire us and illuminate it in the way that, that it needs to be applied to our lives. God, use us so that your name can be glorified in the earth and uh, root us and ground us in a knowledge of your word so that we can be effective for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been enjoying our study in Deuteronomy. Again, Moses, this is Moses' uh, last uh, broad speech to the children of Israel. Before they go in to possess the land, he would not be going in with them. So he is... He is communicating vital information to them so that they can be prepared to, to take possession of what had been promised to their forefathers. And we are at chapter, chapter 13. And let's just start off by reading there in verse 1. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. Now, how many of us would be excited if there was somebody who came in the name of the Lord and they declared that the uh, testimony for their message was being confirmed and we could see the signs and the wonders? It was a confirmation. There was supernatural confirmation that what they were speaking, they were obviously empowered. We would get all excited about us, uh, excited about it and, and probably be telling people all over about it. But it says, and the sign or wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you. But his message is saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. So he's coming and there are signs and wonders. I mean, there are miraculous demonstrations, but these demonstrations are, are uh, a paralleling to his word that's saying we need to follow after God, other gods. So what if someone comes in the name of another God and they're saying, you should worship our God and look, here are miraculous signs and wonders as proof that, that this God is real. Verse 3 says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether or not you love the Lord your God with all your heart with all, and with all your soul. What a what an unusual statement to make. It says that God is allowing this to go on to test you. So be wary. Do you know the Lord your God? Do you know God's principles and God's scripture? And are you easily uh, shaken or are you easily uprooted? Are you easily redirected by things just because there may be some supernatural demonstration? This may be a challenge for people hearing this, but it says here that God may be testing you to see if you really love him and you're really wholeheartedly towards him. Matter of fact, he goes on and has some very strong words here. It says, but that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death for he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God. It says later on in verse 5, So you shall put away the evil from your midst. It's saying here that if a prophet, even though he is giving signs and wonders that are testifying uh, as supposed to be proof to his validity as coming from the Lord, but is he, if he is leading you astray from what God has taught you, then he needs to be put away. Now, in our current day and time, we're not going to go out and stone the person to death, but we, we need to turn away from those people. Don't follow after people just because they have signs and wonders. Make sure that their message and the directions that they're giving are wholeheartedly uh, following God's principles and God's, God's word that's been given us. Don't allow yourself to be derailed by a flashy 
ear-tickling sermon or ear-tickling Bible study or something that is just a feel-good message. It needs to be grounded. Is it bringing you deeper and closer in relationship to the Lord? Or is it distracting you and turning your focus onto things or to ministries or to anything that's taking your focus on the Lord? Look, our pursuit should be the Lord alone. Don't follow after men. Don't follow after ministries. Don't follow after stuff. Don't even follow after blessings. Don't follow after uh, th things that are part of the cup. Don't go for the part when you can have a whole. Why would you settle for a little piece of bread when you can have the whole loaf? So it's a challenging thing here. Where is our zeal for the Lord? He goes on in verse 6 and, and even more strongly hits this. He said, if your brother the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom or your friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you and says, let us go and serve other gods. And he, he goes on, and I, I, won't, I, I won't elaborate by reading all this. You can go back and read chapter 13 yourself. He says, but you don't, don't let your eye pity him. And it goes on and says, they, you shall surely kill them. They should be separated from your camp. They need to be separated from your nation. Speaking specifically to the children of Israel here. Don't associate with people that are trying to take you off path. You know, uh, we want to be able to be available to help reach people for the Lord. But if people are derailing you, you need to separate yourself from them. Get away from them. Don't be, don't be pulled away. This passage is strong. It said, you need to be the one who, who picks up the first stone. And you need to cast the first stone. And then the community will join with you to pass stones. I really am shaking my pen around a whole lot. But you need to be the first one to do that. Now, there's two things in this. One is that if you're bringing accusation at, at someone, you need to bear the brunt of the responsibility <coughs> of, of uh, the fact that they're going to have to be punished for it. If, if you are just throwing an accusation out there, then you're turning and trying to expect someone else to take the brunt of that. Uh, you're really doing a disservice and there needs to be accountability on your part. If you're accusing someone, you also, uh, you need to have responsibility for the outcome of what happens to them. And you will be held responsible for that. Again, it goes on. He said, the, the, the part of that punishment is because they are trying to entice you away from the Lord, your God. And uh, uh, it, it says here, it says you're so all Israel shall hear and fear and not again do such wickedness as this among you. So the severity of the punishment here, the intention is that it is a deterrent to the, the nation of Israel. And uh, we should not tolerate uh, blatant doctrinal error. We should not tolerate people who are trying to take people astray, turn them away from the Lord, and, and entice them with doctrines that aren't right. There needs to be a vocal response. We need to speak out against that. And uh, um, I believe our heart should be to turn that person first. But if they will not turn and if they continue in the error, then they need to, we need to separate ourselves from them. It goes on and speaks here on, in verse 12 and talks about, If you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and have enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods. It says that you should first inquire, you should search out, and you should ask diligently if what has been said is true. So first you need to really validate that story. But if it is true, it says that in this passage, it says that you should strike the whole city down. If they are worshiping other gods, if they are going to infect the rest of the, the, the nation by their immorality, uh, by their uh, idolatry, then you need to wipe them out. And it says that you need to wipe out all of their livestock. You need to take all the plunder of that city and burn it. And basically, I believe this is a, a prohibition here that if you're bringing accusation of someone, you shouldn't in some way be benefiting by the fact, you shouldn't be going in and say, look, they did something wrong, therefore I'm going to receive the plunder. They did something wrong, so let's go plunder them and, and prosper ourselves. He's saying, no, look, if you're bringing this serious kind of accusation against people, then no one should be profiting from it. Let everything be completely concerned. Leave it as a heap. Don't let it be rebuilt again. But don't go out and allow people to bring accusation and then also 
profit from it. And uh, um, it says on verse 18, because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, here's the, the, the key. God was bringing them into a special place of a relationship with him, and he wanted to make sure that when he had, when, when there had been such a high price paid for their deliverance from Egypt, when there had been a high price paid for the, by the corrupt nations that they were dispossessing, that he also wanted to make sure that they really valued and did not allow corruption to sneak back into their camp. When I read this passage, it is a shock to my 20, 2020 uh, religious viewpoint, my Christian viewpoint, because we teach the love of the Lord so much and we don't necessarily focus on his justice. I, I want to just say this. There is no conflict between God's love and his justice. There is a, a conflict between man's sinfulness and God's justice. As long as we love God and serve God, there's no conflict there. But if we step outside and, and, and go become a sinful people, we turn away from the Lord, then we do come in conflict with God's justice. But God has freely given his love to us if we will stay within the boundaries of his justice. And, you know, one thing that stood out to me was when I f saw this and I saw the zeal that God asked for his community of faith to be able to have for his word and for that relationship that they have for him and being set apart for the Lord. It helps me understand where Paul was in his zeal, even though he was persecuting the church at that time. He was following the old covenant mindset in preserving and trying to protect the integrity of, of the scripture that they had. And what brought about a difference in his life, he ended up having a personal revelation of a relationship with Jesus Christ when Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, which completely changed the paradigm in, in Paul's mind. Still passionate for the Lord, still passionate for the Word of God, but now with a fresh revelation of the new relationship that had come through Jesus Christ. Mankind had been restored to relationship. Grace had been made, made available. And it changed Paul's mode of operation with regards to how he presented his faith, how he lived his faith, and he was set free from that. And you know, even today, there are people who are zealously pursuing religion. They're zealously pursuing a, a, a doctrinal belief. But we really need a revelation of, of, of Christ and a, a relationship with him. And that will change our perspective. Jesus had the same type of zeal and even greater than anything that had ever been lived out on this earth. But he was able to hang on a tree and look at a sinful people and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And grace extended itself to the sinful people of the world so that they could be brought back into relationship with the Lord. And I just love that picture. Look, uh, child of God, I just pray that God will give you a fresh revelation of who he is. And that will empower you to be able to serve the Lord today that you will have a, a be full of zeal for the Lord, that you will be sure to love the Lord and to serve the Lord with purity in your own heart, but you will also be gracious and empowered by the Lord to love people that do not agree with you and people that may even be persecuting you. But may God's grace work through us so that we can win those who are lost. God bless you and, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Amen.